We humans have grieved the loss of our dogs ever since they first became man's best friend thousands of years ago. Even bloodthirsty gladiators in Rome mourned their dogs. Here's an epitaph that we found recently. Quote, I am in tears while carrying you to your last resting place as much as I rejoiced when bringing you home in my own hands 15 years ago. Again, that was from a Roman gladiator. Everyone experiences loss in their own way, but it is a pain that is shared by everyone who has ever loved a dog. Hello, I'm James Jacobson. Welcome to The Long Leash. Today on the show, we are discussing pet loss. There is no correct way to grieve, and it can be a long and life-changing process. Our guest today, Nancy Gordon, is on a mission to raise awareness about the different stages of pet grief and how to process the guilt and heartache that sometimes happens with those end-of-life decisions. We also discuss anticipatory grief and how facing that inevitable loss ahead of time can help transform the experience when your dog does cross the Rainbow Bridge. Nancy Gordon, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, I'm so honored to be here to talk about my favorite thing, grief. Yeah, because everyone says grief. Now, that, now that'll now that start off your day in a good way. <laughs> but if you are a dog lover, chances are sometime in your life you may encounter the grief that comes with losing your best furry friend. And uh, I certainly have, and I know so many of our listeners have, and that's where we're delighted to have you on. Now, there are a gazillion people, as you probably know, who are in the pet grief biz. It's almost a business, right? Well, it yeah, it's a service business. It's a service business. And there are a lot of people doing it. It seems like it's uh, increasing in awareness and popularity. But you come at this with some pretty good chops. And we don't normally do this, but just for the sake of just thoroughness, what are your academic chops that prepared you to do what you're doing today? Well, that's a perfect question because what I have done my whole life is combine my professional expertise as a psychotherapist. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and a certified life coach with my personal journeys first with chronic illness and disability after a car accident. And then that grew into working with pet loss and grief when I had to lift up, as I call it, instead of put down both my service dogs within nine months of each other. Okay. You have a master's degree in this. When did you become a licensed social worker initially? Uh, 1982. Okay. I'm showing my age, but I always say I look younger than I am. <laughs> we all do. It's because you have you love dogs. Yeah, they do keep you younger. They keep us young. But the reason I'm doing that is because I want to credentialize you and frame this in a conversation because there's a lot of people out there with a lot of um, ideas about pet grief. But not only have you lived through it, but you were counseling people before and then you had an accident that sort of changed your life. Yes. Yeah, so I have a long professional history for over 40 years. After my car accident, the last six years, I became more and more debilitated from fibromyalgia, which was a result of that accident. And I had to close my business. But hmm. from the time that I ever started working, loss and grief is really a fundamental aspect of whatever presenting problem someone brought into my office. Loss is just an inevitable part of life and grief follows that. And whether it's a divorce or it's a job loss or it's you lose your home or you lose your pet or you lose your parent, it's all loss and grief. So that's been the fundamental piece of my whole career. And as I understand it, this piece of unhealed grief where you've experienced grief and you haven't healed it is fundamental to what you bring to the whole concept of pet grief. For those who are not psychologists and those who have not done a lot of therapy, of which I account myself in both areas, but hopefully we'll fix that today. What is unhealed grief? Unhealed grief often is a lot of guilt in terms of pet loss grief. That's one of the big differences in the grief journey because we're able to euthanize and that brings out a whole other 
layer of grief work and loss. Unhealed grief is like putting a lock on your heart. It comes out when you don't deal with your grief. It comes out in various ways, depression, anxiety, loss of joy in life, motivation, many, many different ways it shows up. And many people don't recognize those kinds of symptoms as being related to a grief. And every time you have a a grief experience, a loss, it brings up any other unhealed grief and even sometimes healed grief from your past. So it becomes like a big mountain of grief by the time you've had living for a couple decades. And you've experienced someone, and this could be a mom or a grandparent or a friend or a friend of a friend, or if you're in school, a parent of someone who is one of your classmates, there could be this kind of grief opportunity. And so what is unhealed grief just in the human dimension, not just the animal dimension? What does it look like? And how does it manifest? And how do you, as a therapist, what are some things that you look at? Well, as I said, a lot of grief shows up as anxiety, depression. Those are two big ones. Are those the two biggest that you see and think, oh, if you see anxiety or you see clinical depression, you wonder, I wonder if there's some grief behind that that's not been healed. Yes. And there usually is. And there are other, you know, there are other symptoms people have, you know, sort of um, seem kind of lost, you know, don't know what to do with their life or don't really enjoy their life. That's often a sign of unhealed grief, whether Mm -hmm. You know, it's a person or a pet or a divorce. It comes from so many different life experiences. Okay. When I was a teenager back in the 1980s, I had the opportunity to to interview Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who is the author of the book, The Five Stages of Grief. Right. And she came up with those five stages, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. I had to look at a cheat sheet because I don't remember them exactly. But you have expanded upon her work to say they're not just five stages of grief, at least when it comes to pets, there are seven. So can you outline those seven stages? Yeah, those seven stages actually relate to any grief, human loss as well. Okay. So the first stage that I think wasn't addressed by her, partly because she was working with dying patients. Mm -hmm is anticipatory grief. And it is what I consider the first stage of grief. It's where you realize that you're going to experience a loss with this person or this pet, and there's no way you can stop it. It's going to happen. And until it happens, you're living in that experience of actually experiencing the loss, even though not in its fullest form. And within that, there are what I consider to be seven states of experience that people go through. Within anticipatory grief? Within anticipatory grief, yes. Okay, so let me just slow it down or or make sure I understand it, because I think it's so pivotal to what you do and to this discussion. You say it's not only, you know, feeling that a loved one is going to die, but feeling the inevitability of it. Yeah. So obviously, you know, (laughs) we're all going to die. Again, just to throw out my psychological words that I'm probably misusing. There's, you know, hypochondria where you're like, oh my God, this is going to kill me. This is going to kill me. But then there's this inevitability that, you know, say in the case of a dog, you know that this is a terminal illness or they're, you know, 16 years old and the average lifespan is not that for this particular breed. Right. Okay. So break down, are there seven things that within this anticipatory grief that, that you'd like to discuss? Yeah. So some of the states of experience are the same, whether it's human or pet. But one of the differences is that with pets, it's legal to euthanize. Mm -hmm. So that puts a huge responsibility on the pet parents to make that decision. And what most people have guilt about is whether they made that decision correctly, whether the timing was right, whether how they did it was right, whether their pet suffered or not, how to know whether their pet is suffering or not. And one of the things that I've encountered about sort of like one of the reasons to really embrace anticipatory grief is that 
if you get support and you educate yourself about the grief journey and about what's happening to your animal and you get support and guidance, and that includes through your veterinarians. A lot of people don't necessarily even ask their vets very many questions, and some vets are not comfortable answering that question at all. What I think is really heartbreaking because they're the best to know mm-hmm. in terms of the medical issues right. and guidance for that. So a lot of people that I see, more people come to me after the loss, sometimes within hours, sometimes within days, sometimes a day, and say they're absolutely devastated and they think they made a mistake or they you know, feel tremendous guilt about, I should have done this, I should have done that. And what I experienced in doing, you know, my own anticipatory grief with Toaster and Pink, which took a couple years, actually, I went through their debilitating aging process, is that when you face it, when you have the courage to face it, you are preventing a lot of guilt that follows loss. And to me, that is one of the most transformational pieces of doing the anticipatory grief work. Facing it ahead of time, obviously. Ahead of time. That's what it's all about. And when you do that, you can transform the whole experience, not only for yourself, but for your pet. Okay. Because while you're feeling overwhelmed and hopeless and helpless and not knowing what to do and not making decisions because you don't know what to do, your pet is watching all that anxiety and depression. Mm-hmm. And you can't be present. And one of the most important parts of using anticipatory grief is to be present. To be present with your dog while your dog is alive and loving you and licking. And yes. maybe he or she is a little bit under the weather and not feeling well. But yes. And it's what they teach us in terms of how to live to the best degree we can. I wrote a whole book on that subject on how to meditate with your dog. So it's it's true. Okay, so so that's anticipatory grief. So there are seven stages to this anticipatory grief or seven steps. What are those? So there's seven, I call them experiences separate from the stages, but they're within the stages of my seven stages of grief. Mm Mm-hmm. The first is the experience of shock and denial that is the same as in Kubler-Ross's experience, only this occurs in anticipatory grief while you still have your pet. It's like people say, I can't believe this is happening. Mm. And they maybe procrastinate and put off doing all the things that would be action steps towards letting go because of that. So, This is part of what matches up with my seven practices, the first of which... You like seven. I like seven. I like seven. It's like a good number, and it's a lucky number, I think. It is. So this matches up with my seven practices, the first of which is surrender without giving up. And that's sort of the antidote to the shock and denial is is to surrender, is to come to understand that you have to accept what is. Mm -hmm. And Toaster and Pink, in my journey of letting them go, really taught me even a deeper level about surrender, which I discovered when I had my car accident and had to, after six years of working, become so debilitated that I had to close my business. Mm -hmm. And I thought I was surrendering, but really I was giving up. I didn't learn about surrender till after I closed my business, and it was a very humbling experience. Mm-hmm. And that, that's the journey that I went on with Toaster and Pink early on, was figuring out these seven practices of how to find my resilience and hope and get back to my sole purpose of helping people. So Toaster, in my experience with her, because it was coming for a long time, you know, like I said, two years I began to see that rainbow bridge on the horizon. And that was the start of my anticipatory grief, two years before I actually lifted her up. And through those two years, different things occurred. And that's how I developed this idea of experiences, because they were mine and other clients, Mm -hmm. that are within these stages of anticipatory grief. So the first is a shock and denial. The second is we start experience caregiving reversal roles. So now instead of them sort of taking care of us Mm -hmm. in many ways, we're taking care of them. I see. And especially in the case of your first 
dog that you mentioned, Toaster, who was a service dog. So you were used to Toaster providing you with the caring. And right. then you realized the roles have reversed. Okay. What else is considered within anticipatory grief? So then there's the experience of cognitive dissonance. Okay. So this is what pet parents describe. Another good describe. psychological term there. Yes. Well, I'm going to explain it. <laughs> This is what pet parents describe as feeling overwhelmed, mm. as feeling very conflicted mm -hmm. as to what to do, as they feel confused. This is a good example. I experienced a lot of cognitive dissonance about letting pink go. So Toaster taught me a lot about the side of surrender. I call it two-sided surrender is the practice. And Toaster taught me about accepting what is, that aspect of surrender. Pink taught me the other side of that coin. It's like a two-sided coin, which is about letting go. And I had a lot of difficulty letting pink go. And that created a lot of cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. Because, for example, one of the things that I experienced by the very end that a lot of pet parents experience, I've had many clients who describe they're not even getting sleep. They're taking care of their pets and they can't sleep. They're afraid they're going to die when they're asleep, when the person is asleep. And so what I experienced, for example, with Pink is that I was so depleted by the time she really, you know, needed to go. I had a hard time making that decision because I didn't want to let her go. And at the same time, I was losing my whole life, my ground, my sleep, you know, my functioning. It was like all I was doing was hospice care with her 24-7. Mm -hmm. You got to take care of yourself first. Right. It's like being on the airplane where they say, you know, put on your mask first before you put on your child or, or so to be able to help other people. So you got to put on your oxygen mask first. Right. Okay. That's good. But it creates that period and this is, again, where we have the difference with human loss versus pet loss. We have the ability to make that decision. Mm -hmm. We can euthanize. Mm -hmm. And so that decision creates a lot of cognitive dissonance. You want to do what's best for them. You want to do what's best for you. And somewhere in the middle, there's a whole lot of gray area that is very anxiety producing. That's where mm -hmm. a lot of anxiety and depression comes from. And a rule of thumb that I've picked up the hard way is it's better a day or a week too early than a day or a week too late. But that's that's for other shows. Okay, what are some other steps? Well, that's the guilt part of that you can circumvent with going through anticipatory grief in a way where you can make good informed decisions. I just had a client start with me who was feeling terrible guilt and regret because he was not expecting the terminal diagnosis, and then he made a decision to put down his cat. And so he felt terrible. And that's what I see happens a lot with people is they end up in the ER, and there's no one really, you know, professional to help them make this decision. And so they make an impulsive decision mm -hmm. for whatever reasons, and then they feel guilty later. Okay. What's the next part of anticipatory grief? Going into depression and anxiety. So that is a state that can also immobilize people from, you know, making good decisions, from doing good self-care. And then there's experience of resisting the surrendering that comes out of all of this, that it's really hard to let go. And making that decision when to euthanize. Yes, when to let go. Or if. Or if, exactly. Or to... In the human space, what I've become fond of using, because I, I had to learn it myself, is a term that a hospice doctor taught me called A-N-D, allow natural death. And it's not something that is all that commonly used in the veterinary space for a myriad of reasons, but it is an interesting thing, especially when you're talking about people. Yes, that's totally true. And it's a really hard decision to make for pet parents. Mm -hmm. And that's where, you know, I want to see my work really make a difference in how people go through this part of losing a pet. And it all applies to losing a person, too, except that we don't have that ability to make the decision about whether they live or die for, in most cases. What happens when you're resisting surrender and accepting what is and then going forward, it's difficult to stay present, as we talked about before. And that 
that is such a tragedy because that is one of the biggest healing experiences in pet grief when you still have your pet with you is to be how to be present. And I had one client who contacted me literally the day he was going to put his dog down and he couldn't stop crying. And he called because he felt guilty about being so sad in front of his dog. (laughs) And I said, there's no either or, there's both. And you can be sad. You can let your dog comfort you. You know, pink would lick my tears. Mm -hmm. And you can also be there for your dog. And that changed his whole trajectory of that day with his dog. And he followed up with me and said, you know, it was the best day he'd ever with his dog. It can be. We talk a lot about this exercise, about basically when it's near the end, taking the time and perhaps doing this in multiple days to talk to your dog or your pet and say, here's your life story. Let me tell you, the first time I saw you, you were this little and I got you and you, and kind of basically recounting the story. And that is Again, amateur psychologist here, but that is very therapeutic for both the person and the dog because that kinship is clear and is totally there. And uh, again, I know firsthand, and we'll talk about that in a bit. So let's finish up on anticipatory grief, and then I got something planned. So the the seventh experience, and these are not necessarily always in this order. Sure, but this <laughs> the seventh experience is finding hope and transformation Mm -hmm. through this anticipatory grief journey. And that's where you can really circumvent a lot of guilt, prevent a lot of guilt from after the loss, and you can grow from this. You know, it's hard for people to be present in the midst of grief and sadness and depression. That's one of the reasons why grief has been such a no-no to talk about. It's like people are afraid of of feeling. Mm -hmm. They're afraid of feeling, they're afraid of death, and I get all that. It's not easy. I mean, even as a professional, knowing all I knew, I mean, I I was very depressed and affected by what was going on with Toaster and Pink. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that I did was I started a ritual with them literally about two years before I lifted them up, where I would start the day with Toaster and pink, but first with toaster, whispering in her ear, we have another day. (laughs) And then at the end of the night, I would whisper, we had another day. And I did that even on her last day. (laughs) And then I also whispered to them towards the end, I'd say in the last six months or so, I miss you already. And I could not love you more. (laughs) We had another day. I miss you already. Yeah. And I couldn't love you anymore. Yeah. And that was a very healing practice. That was incorporating a ritual that allowed me to be present with them, to feel my grief, to anticipate the grief, and yet still be there. Wow. And that's why I entitled my book, I Miss You Already, Bearing the Unbearable Loss of Your Pet. Okay. And that's anticipatory grief. And then there are the five stages that Dr. Ross talks about. Do you want to briefly go through those in, in bullet fashion? So her first is shock and denial, and that is the same as what I talk about. But this happens after the person or the animal has passed. Right. Okay. Her next stage is anger, and that's often known to be um, sort of the flip side of depression. Instead of feeling, it's easier sometimes to feel angry than depressed. Talk about anger as it relates to losing a dog. So a lot of people feel angry at themselves, Mm. again, with it's an aspect of the guilt. I wished I had done this. I'm mad at myself, you know. They have a lot of regrets. Had I only fed my dog this? Right. Had I only gone to the veterinarian more often? Right. Had I not done this, if we didn't move there, this wouldn't have, and sort of that whole feeling of tons of regret and guilt. It's self-anger. That's right. Or anger at the company down the street that is polluting the water that is clearly caused my dog's cancer. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All of that. So there's anger and it's also a reaction just in general to the helpless, hopeless feeling that you have after you lose someone. Mm-hmm. And then that 
as I said, anger often is the other flip side of depression. So what Kubler-Ross noted comes after anger is the depression. They can't believe that the loss has happened, but they're now really experiencing the loss, the missing, the triggers. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what happens when you, you know, are still processing the grief. And it's an unexpected roller coaster that I hope to help educate people how to navigate. And then bargaining. Yeah, the bargaining is sort of like, you know, your wishful thinking to get out of all this depression. And it's not really a stage that I found that common with pets. With pets, okay. Yeah. Then her, her next stage is acceptance, mm-hmm. right? That's more about like you come to terms with it and you go on with your life. And I think that's a really good springboard to get to for going farther with the experience and utilizing that experience to grow yourself as a person, Mm -hmm. to change sometimes how you live, how you think, how you relate to others. I know when I was facing my mother's loss, she was dying in a two-year cancer process, and I really saw the value of knowing, so I'm in anticipatory grief with her, Mm -hmm. so knowing she's going, how does this change how I interact with her, with anyone else, with my loved ones? And humans have a lot of difficulty navigating that whole anticipatory grief because there's also the family dynamic that enter into all of that stage when you're watching your parents decline, for example. And how does that apply to a dog? Oh, it's huge. The more that you grow through grief, like for me, like understanding the nuances of surrender, I became more self-forgiving, less guilt, living my life in a way that I'm less likely to experience regret and guilt because I'm making choices now in that relationship with that pet that I'm not going to regret. So, you know, I don't leave conversations in a bad state for example, because you just never know. People say, don't go to bed angry. That's kind of the same thing. That's a good way of getting that lesson learned. Okay, so those are the the six stages, the five from Dr. Ross plus the anticipatory grief, and then you have a seventh stage. Well, the seventh is the hope and transformation. It's like going beyond just accepting and living your life. It's going beyond that. Like a lot of people close their hearts with unhealed grief. Mm -hmm. And where that shows up is, They'll say, I'm never going to get another dog. That's where I wanted to go with this. I got divorced. It was horrible. I'm never getting married again. That's where transformational grief makes a difference. That's going beyond accepting what happened, Mm -hmm. that you had loss. And then your way of dealing with it is to try and prevent future losses, which is never possible because life is just full of one loss after another. So when you heal your grief, which doesn't mean you ever stop missing the person or your pet, But you get to a place where, like, now I don't cry anymore when I talk about Toaster and Pink. You know, there was a period of time after I lost them that, well, before I lost them and after I lost them, I couldn't, you know, talk about what happened without crying sometimes. So it changes. The grief doesn't necessarily, when I say healed, it's not fully ever gone necessarily, but it shows up in different ways and it affects you differently. And all of how it shows up and affects you differently depends on how you respond to the grief. Okay. And that is where you or a grief counselor comes in to help you process all of these stages and deal with that. Right. I want to take a break right now, but when we come back, I'm going to ask you to kind of give me a little mini session as I talk about the losses that I've experienced. Will you do that for us? Of course. Okay. And we'll invite you to listen in and uh, watch my couch session. We'll be right back. And now a message from your dog. Every day with you is like a day at the beach. And I want as many beach days as possible. I want to run and sniff and find a good stick to carry. I want to roll in the grass and warm my belly in the sun. I want to walk with you, run with you, sleep with you, eat with you. And when I eat with you, I want Everpup. 
the green grassy beef liver spiked smell wakes my senses. You may not realize this, but it tastes like homemade gravy, especially when you wet it. It infuses any food you give me with health and life and vibrancy. I can feel it, Everpup traveling to every cell in my body, nourishing each one. Does it roll back time? Of course not, not really, but it helps me feel like I'm on top of the world. I'm so glad you're giving it to me every day because every day I'm so glad to be with you. I'm so grateful to be your dog and for the ever pup you give me. So now that you know what your dog wants, get Everpup, the ultimate dog supplement. Everpup is available in select pet shops and on Amazon. But to get the best price possible, join the Everpup Club at everpupclub.com, where you'll get your first jar for just $8 with free shipping anywhere in the U.S. Go to everpupclub.com and use the discount code DPN. That is everpupclub.com. Everpup, every day. We are back with Nancy Gordon. Nancy, let's do a little therapy session, a mini therapy session with me uh, uh, over the fact that uh, I lost during the pandemic, not one, but two of our dogs and a number of people, but we won't go into the people part. But when you approach conversation with a new client, how does that go? Well, I ask questions to help them explain what their journey was. So I would ask you some questions. Do you want me to ask you some questions? Go ahead. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So I would first ask, how long ago was that? Uh, we put Kanga down in very late August, a, a few months ago. Oh, very recent. That's all, that's mm-hmm. like yesterday mm-hmm. in, uh, in grief days. <laughs> Does it feel like that? Like it was that soon. It feels recent, but every day gets a little bit better. Yeah, that's good. It does get better with time. And were these two dogs related? Well, we called them sisters, but they weren't really related, but they, we kind of treated them as if they were, we had Kanga and Rue. Oh, Kanga and Rue. <laughs> Kanga and Rue. So Kanga was our first, and then we rescued a dog. And of course, <clears throat> because I like funniness and Winnie the Pooh. The second dog got named Rue, but Rue passed before Kanga did. And they were very different dogs, very, very different dogs, both Maltese, but very different dogs. Uh-huh, yeah, they're, they're all different. And our relationships with them are different, which has an impact on grief, the role of the relationship. Mm-hmm. So how old were each of them when, when they went, roughly? Kanga was about 14, 15 years old, and Rue was a little younger when she passed. Okay. So the old, both older dogs, though. They, they, were, they were both older ladies. Yeah. Yeah. Seniors. So tell me a little bit about how you parted with both of them. What was that whole experience like for you? Well, very different. And in part of, because I work with so many people here at Dog Podcast Network who have experienced loss and I interviewed a lot of people and, and I, I just get a sense of what it is. I would have to say that while Kanga was very much my heart dog and my wife's heart dog and very close, like, you know, people say, I love all my children equally. Well, I think that's not always true. I, nope. I'm the first to admit like, it's okay. I think sometimes one, one dog is a little closer, but it's okay. We don't want to say that out loud, but just between you and me, I think it's, we, I'm going to admit that. So Kanga was our heart dog, and when we knew it was time, and I had been adhering to this wisdom that we had picked up on from conversations like this, that it's better to do it a day or a week too early than a day or a week too late. So when we knew it was time, I found through tons of serendipity a veterinarian who could help sort of last minute on the day that we chose. And we did it outdoors under a avocado tree. And, and I had never met the veterinarian before. And I wanted this not to be a hospital experience. Uh-huh. So we went up country. I live on an island here. In, I live in Maui. And we went up country and we met the vet. When she pulled up in her truck, I, for some reason, was mesmerized by her ring, which is a strange thing. And I looked at it and I said, did you go to UVA, the University of Virginia? She said, 
yes, because there's a tiny little ring. I'm like, so did I. And I, let me tell you, there are very few people here in, in Maui who have ever heard of UVA, much less attended it. So it was, it was just sort of, to me, a little sign from the universe, like, I think this is kind of the right person to work on. And then it was, uh, you know, without getting into too much detail, it was a, a very um, sweet, beautiful process as, as she went. That's what I call a lift up. A lift up. It was. It felt like a lift up, as opposed to a put down. It was. It was definitely. It was. A, you know, just went to sleep. We went to McDonald's first. <clears throat> uh, shout out to McDonald's. So we did that because towards the end, you know, all sorts of things are happening and and uh -huh. appetite. But McDonald's seems to seems to really spark appetite. Yeah. And uh, and I recorded a lot of this stuff on video, but I haven't had the 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 courage the courage to watch those videos someday I will. Yeah. But yeah, it was just, you know, but she really had a, had a good, <laughs> had a good, <laughs> good burger. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then we did that and, and she died on my lap. Um, and it was as gentle and there were deer and there were, you know, it was, it was crisp uh, and chilly for, for Hawaii and I was cold, but I, I, it was just a very um, sweet, tender experience. Yeah. It sounds like you were really present with her. Did you feel she was present with you? I felt she had no idea what was happening. So I felt that she was present with us in the same way she's always was always present with us, uh, totally aware. And again, I had spent so much time in the lead up to this talking to Kanga about the first day we got to you and how I went over and I flew over there and telling her her whole journey multiple times. Uh -huh. And so that was what I believe was in her mind. And I'm just, I'm laying on daddy's lap which is my favorite place yes and, and, and mom's pet in my back end and and so um yeah so i would say she was present with you she was present okay yeah i understand she was present with you did you interpret my question to mean did she know was she present in terms of knowing what was going to happen to her yes that's what i meant that's what yeah. i thought you meant no yeah. no no you described exactly what i was asking is it she was there with you. She she knew you were oh. there. She was giving you her love and she was receiving your love and that's being present. Okay. Yes, we were very much present. Yeah. It was just another another moment on dad's lap. Yeah, yeah. and she knew she was being loved and cared about, mm. which is the last message you want to give your pet, right? Mm. So you did do that. So how do you feel about do you feel guilt that she didn't know what was going on? Cuz when you paused there, was that a hard feeling? Um, no, I think, I think probably wrapped up in all that is the feeling like, even though I think we did everything right, it's just really like, I wish she was here now. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So it's, it's, yeah, it's sort of, it's a bit of melancholy. I guess. Yes. And I think that is often what happens when pet parents feel some degree of regret or guilt that what that feeling really serves is a distraction from the missing, hmm. from the feeling of missing. A distraction from the missing. Okay, I get that. So the more you're wrapped up in guilt and regret and like you started to say, you know, I'm not sure we did everything right, that takes you away from what's really underneath it is that melancholy, that mm -hmm. sadness that she's gone. And that's the feeling, though, that when you really start to allow yourself to feel it and express it and get support for it, which is in a variety of ways, that's how you heal it. Mm. Yeah. And I felt this, I still feel this, but it, it feels like um, this weight that is just like, I, I, I want that hug. And so... <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to leave this in our edit or not, but we have a, a little um, stuffed animal that is a rabbit. But anyway, it's a little rabbit who represented Kanga. And my wife would pack it. I used to travel a lot, hundreds of thousands of miles a year. And little Kanga, the rabbit, would manage its way into my suitcase. And so whatever I'd unpack, it'd be like, which is kind of cute. So when we came home that night, 
I put that little rabbit right next to my chest, right next to my heart. And uh, I'm not too embarrassed to admit she still sleeps right there at night, sort of as a little bit of weight, physical weight. To, to, yes. To... And I don't know if you know what that term for that is in the grief oh, process. Crazy. It's called, <laughs> no, it is not crazy at all. And I'll share my own yellow blanket story. It's called a continued bond. Uh, and that is a huge part of healing grief, mm -hmm. human or pet. So you found an object that you felt connected to Kanga by, mm -hmm. through which you felt connected. And that brought some comfort on a physical level because she did sit on your chest and you did have that weight feeling of her warm body. Mm -hmm. And it's comforting. And that's what we want to experience in our grief journey is finding all the ways that you can stay connected, that you can stay with that love that's unconditional and eternal from and with your pet. Mm -hmm. And there are many ways to do it. That's a good example of one. Okay. So when Pink left, I had an animal communicator give me a reading about Toaster and Pink after probably within a year or a little more. But she told me Pink was telling me to play with this yellow object. And at the time, this is a weird story, but at the time, I was looking on the floor at Pink's yellow blanket. And she described this toy as yellow. And I knew immediately Pink was telling me, this is our continued bond. Sleep with this blanket use this blanket to feel me because pink was hairless. Mm -hmm. And so she was always wrapped up in something, clothes or a blanket, including this yellow blanket. So that was how I got to experience. And that came from pink, I believe. Anyway. I love it. I totally get it. That's beautiful. Well, yeah, we still feel them well after they are gone. So Nancy, when, thank you for doing that. When someone says to you, my friends just don't understand why I'm so upset about the loss of my dog. They just say, it's just a dog. Yeah. How do you counsel them on how to respond to their friends and family? Well, in two ways, uh, depending on where they are in their own grief journey and what their issues are and how comfortable they are with expressing authentically what they feel and experience with someone. Mm -hmm. So if they're comfortable, I say... Can you use this opportunity, this interaction, as a way to educate people about pet grief, about grief in general, and say, here's what it's really like for me? And, you know, can you not judge me about mm -hmm. and explain the role of that dog, for example? Oh, it's just a dog. Well, it isn't just a dog. It's like a family member. You can't just say, you know, oh, my sister died. Oh, well, you have another sister. That doesn't make any <laughs> sense, right? Yeah. It's the sister that died. And a lot of what is involved in that process is the role of the relationship. So if this is a really difficult grief and goes a long time, which mine did, for example, mm -hmm. if you can explain what this dog meant to you, how the absence of this dog impacts your daily life, mm -hmm. then that's one more person who gets a different perspective on what pet grief is. And hopefully we'll never say something like that to someone. Again. Then the other alternative to that for an immediate response, I would give someone who wasn't able to, you know, be in a place to educate their friend or their family or whomever, I would say, they're not your support people right now. Mm. You need support. You need validation. You need people to witness, you know, grief is all about sharing. And in that sharing, you're witnessing someone's pain. And in that witnessing, there's comfort, even if it's not that they necessarily understand your grief, but they are there with you with your grief. Then I say, they're not your people, they're not your support people right now. Find other supports. You know, if they're working with me, I would say, I'm that person. Yeah, I'm your person. That's a perfect segue. So how does someone get in touch with you or more generally, how does someone find the right therapist who understands pet loss to help them through this process? Well, I'll start with that one first and then I'll explain how to connect with me. So 
Some guidelines for working with anybody for anything is getting referrals if you can from someone that you trust, Mm -hmm. interviewing somebody, you know, before diving in. That's perfectly fine to do. You know, the most important thing is that you have a good experience with whoever you're working with. So try and get a referral, do a kind of test drive. When you say a test drive. Like like have an introductory session, like do an a intake. A short session, okay. And will most therapists do that for free? Or is there usually? For free or, n- or not for free, it doesn't really, I mean, doesn't matter. Okay. They can do it however that person, if they feel like they really need one for free, go for it. But those tend to be shorter, like 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Right. It's really hard, especially if you're not, therapy minded or you haven't had therapy experience or you haven't lost a pet before. And even though you lost your grandparent, this pet grief is way worse than your grandparent. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yes. Right. So I I hear that a lot. It's like, this is like no grief I've ever experienced. Mm -hmm. And I have a couple ideas about why that is. And one is that animals are, are a source of almost universally unconditional love. It's our source for that. And that, that's hard to replace. Right. You don't often find family members unconditionally loving. Maybe a grandma. But yeah. No, okay. it's, it's much harder. I think that's one reason why the grief is so much deeper is because that's maybe the person's first experience with being loved for themselves mm-hmm. unconditionally. Got it. Then there are questions to ask. You know, it's okay to ask. What experience do you have? Do you have any personal experience? It's the way I work. And that's my book, I Miss You Already, is really a teaching memoir about incorporating my personal journey with my professional skills and expertise about loss and grief. And I learned when I went on disability and closed my practice, I really learned the value of a therapist having personal experience of whatever they're helping a client with to some degree. It's not a requirement, but there's a level when you walk in somebody's shoes, you get it Mm -hmm. in a way other people don't necessarily get it. So find that person who you feel does really get it. Okay. And then in terms of getting in touch with you, what's the best way? So I have um, a link tree, which is a one URL that then has a drop down menu of all the different ways to work with me or get my books or listen to interviews. We'll put a link to that in the show notes from today's episode. Yeah. And then the other way to get in touch with me is also to go to my website, which is nancygordonglobal.com. And on the home page, there's a little box that you can download a free PDF called What is Grief and the Powerful Practices to Navigate It. Mm-hmm. So it gives you a little snippet of my work and a little bit of like grief education. And you can just put your email address in there and you'll get that. And then that's also a way to contact me. Awesome. We'll put those links in uh, the episode notes for today's show. Uh, in addition to some other episodes of other shows from Dog Podcast Network that may be helpful. I think that point about like, make sure you're dealing with a therapist who really understands pet grief makes sense. We spoke with a, a lawyer several years ago who was helping people do pet estates and you figure, well, uh, you know, an estate attorney should understand it, but it turns out one of the best pieces of advice is if you're planning for your pets, if you should die before your pet, you probably want to deal with an attorney who has experience and is a pet lover. Otherwise, they're just going to think of it as property. Oh, yes. So really understanding is key. Yes. And that is such an important thing for pet parents to put in place, especially elderly, but not necessarily. I mean, it's anybody can go before their pet and That's how some of them end up in rescues, you know, in animal shelters, because no family member will take them. Absolutely. So that's great. I'm glad you mentioned that. Nancy Gordon, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much. It was my honor. Well, that is all we have time for on today's show. If you'd like to learn more about Nancy Gordon and her upcoming book, Anticipatory Pet Loss and Grief, we have a link to that on our website and in today's show notes. You can find our website at longleashshow.com. There you can also find the link to all the past episodes of The Long Leash and our sister shows on Dog Podcast Network. 
If you enjoyed today's show, please subscribe or follow us in your favorite podcast app so you'll never miss another episode. And you can also find us on YouTube. I want to thank you for joining us today. I'm James Jacobson. On behalf of all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, I'd like to wish you and your dog a very warm aloha. Aloha.